Located east of central Lima with a population of approximately 180,000 settlers, El Agostino consists of three zones, the flat area, the hilly area, and the banks of the Rimac River. El Agostino is one of the oldest informal settlements in Lima, beginning in the 1940s. The land was illegally invaded, which led to unplanned development. Due to unique invasion, settle first and get services later, El Agostino faces various risks on a daily basis. The informal nature of the settlement led to the people of El Agostino organizing themselves to improve their situation, as well as to resolve conflicts with authorities, fostering an early strong sense of community. El Agostino is significant in Lima's development due to its unique political and social history, method of land invasion, and its close location to central Lima. El Agostino's location near to La Gamara and La Parada Market in the 50s and 60s attracted a lot of inward migration. There are three historical points that brought significant influence on El Agostino. The first historical point was, creation, was the creation of the Law of Pariadas in 1961. The law was created since informal settlements became significantly large and residents protested through a strong sense of community. The Law of Barriadas allowed the squatters and illegal residents individual property rights, which provided them with basic services, hence formalizing this area. The second historical point in El Agostino was the creation of the Miadas Project in 1980, which aimed to divide El Agostino into eight zones, which were to be governed separately. This was so that local residents and NGOs could be better involved in the political system. This would also help empower each district to better govern themselves. However, the Miadas project failed due to a lack of resources, which caused further conflict between said actors. The third historical changing point was President Fujimori's regime from 2003, which transformed Peru through neoliberalism, a political shift from a long history of left party to right, which ultimately meant that political interest shifted from the people's needs to the regeneration of the area, for example, cable cars, retention walls, and housing projects through mi vivienda, etc. As of now, El Agostino is still largely informal, with the land occupation and haphazard development reinforcing the risks faced by many in the community today. The history of risk in El Agostino consists of housing collapses, water issues, violence, and crime. However, the degree of these risks have developed and become profoundly interconnected throughout time, with the addition of overcrowding and TB further exacerbating the risks. Risk in El Agostino has always existed, A, because of its unique invasion of the land, whereby the land was invaded first and the services came later, and B, the precarious self-constructed housing. Level of risk has increased over time as rapid migration into the district caused overcrowding, creating an urban environment which has meant domestic violence and TB are growing problems. Risk has also been aggravated by political violence, crime, economic instability, and drug usage. El Independiente, in particular, is highly representative of the risks in El Agustino as a whole. The level of political focus on El Agostino has varied since the initial invasion, which has been dictated largely by political shifts from left to right, with one notable example occurring under President Fujimori's regime, which had a strong impact on promoting the regeneration of the area. This was, however, for economic purposes rather than to tackle residents' concern. Government focus on regeneration and urbanization has also hindered the implementation of efficient risk reduction strategies, such as improving housing quality in the area. El Independiente was chosen as a case study to focus on as the characteristics of this area are highly representative of the rest of El Agustino. This includes a number of factors, one being that El Independiente consists of both hilly and flat areas, and hence would reflect many of the risks and living conditions experienced in the rest of the region. El Independiente has also been marked particularly as an area of high risk. In regards to water issues, Sedapal only provides the residents of El Independiente with two hours of water in the morning and two hours in the evening. This water is highly contaminated and these residents have a fixed water bill.
From these images, we can see a comparison between a water bill from a resident in Miraflores who pays 25.29 soles for unlimited access to potable water and a water bill from a resident in El Independiente who pays 101.44 soles for water that is both inefficient in quality and quantity. This is a representation of the injustice of the situation and the risks faced by these inhabitants. Despite living near the center of Lima on a highly visible hill, the people are neglected and treated as invisible. The treatment of the people and increase in risk faced by those in El Independiente and the wider district is also linked to a decrease in sense of community. This decrease in sense of community in fact replicates and reproduces risks in itself due to a number of reasons. Firstly, the community are less willing to help each other in times of need. Secondly, community fragmentation is linked to higher rates of crime, violence, and drug use. Rob Nixon's concepts of slow violence, disease of gigantism, and tyranny of scale can be applied to issues regarding visibility, risk, and development in El Independiente. The idea of slow violence states that it is difficult to bring attention to issues and risks, such as water scarcity in El Independiente. This is because it is spectacle deficient and does not grab media attention. It is difficult to measure and is regarded as ordinary and part of the norm because the risk falls almost wholly on the unsheltered poor. Slow violence also involves the foreign burden, which is when the actions of an external group, such as housing developers, negatively impact and offload risks onto other groups, usually marginalized people, who would, as a result, be dealing with increasingly overcrowded and unstable housing conditions. The people of El Independiente also experience invisibility and amnesia. They are the un uninhabitants. Their presence is considered illegal, a nuisance. They are not mapped, nor part of any official statistics, and are excluded from national plans. The disease of gigantism and the tyranny of scale also apply to El Independiente. The disease of gigantism is the dangerous outlook whereby large-scale projects are created for the sake of appearances. This leads to the tyranny of scale. Larger projects, A, benefit marginalized groups less, and B, exclude these groups even more, which reinforces the community's invisibility. The proposed cable car project is an example of this. El Agostino is supposedly being modernized and developed, but what this is really creating is a widening gap between the poor and the rich, the un uninhabitants and the neoliberals. These concepts all fit into environmental injustice, in particular, the lack of recognition and participation. Agostino experiences both social risk and physical risk that can be classified on three different scales, everyday risk, cumulative risk, and latent or episodic risk. We have to find out that social risk and physical risks are intertwined. In fact, they are linked by various factors that contribute to each other to increase and reproduce risks over time. These risks have been present in the area since the initial settler settlers arrived and have increased over time with overcrowding and deteriorating physical conditions, including insecure land and humidity in houses. Inconsistent political involvement has also contributed to the proliferation of these risks since a. governmental plans and approaches have not been cohesive, and b. the government has focused their attention on cumulative and episodic risk rather than daily risk. In fact, the government did try to provide solutions for TB and poor housing, however, they have been ineffective because the municipality does not fully understand the dynamics of, the, of these issues, for example, stigmatization of TB, and are not tackling the fundamental causes of the risk, for example, quality of housing. Furthermore, the municipal, municipal government is not paying attention to the debilitating risks and impacts linked to insufficient water and housing since residents are uninhabitants and invisible to them. The inefficient provision of water by Sedapal, in particular, is a clear example of the disease of gigantism, given the inaccessible and large scale of the organization and their reluctance to interact with the local community, despite their headquarters being located nearby. For example, the government launched housing projects to deal with incoming residents such as Mi Vivienda and Tecnopropio, and mega projects such as the cable cars. 
but they also failed in meeting the actual needs of the population, such as regular and sufficient amount of water, resulting in increasing tensions between the political bodies and the community. In fact, their perception of risk as well as their approach to tackling them differ. While the government uses a top-down strategy, communities are in favor of bottom-up initiatives. In tackling some of the risks outlined in our video, there are some coping mechanisms used by the residents to help mitigate these risks. Interventions by the municipality, Sadapal, and the World Health Organization are often inefficient due to misunderstanding of underlying causes, misrecognition, and insufficient investment in infrastructure and services. An example of a coping mechanism used by the community to overcome their water issues includes storing water in containers as well as informally purchasing water from neighbors connected to the supply. With regards to housing, the community has created a housing construction booklet to aid in strengthening housing structures, to improve the accessibility and mobility between levels of the hill in El Independiente, residents have built informal staircases. In terms of deterring youth from engaging in criminal activity, parents encourage their children to stay in school for as long as is feasible for the family, and the community has also been organizing activities for children on weekends. Although many of these coping mechanisms help residents deal with everyday risks, Due to a lack of technical assistance and resources, often these mechanisms further reproduce risks and fail to correctly deal with the problems at hand. For example, there is little to no coping mechanism for TB, where the lack of coping mechanisms leads to people just ignoring and trying to hide the disease for fear of social stigmatization. We have identified that invisibility and lack of community solidarity are entry points to breaking the risk cycles in El Agustino. Our strategies can be split into three phases. The first phase consists of restoring a sense of community within El Agustino in order to create stronger relationships between actors. This will allow them to move on to phase two, which is to jointly form strategic action plans to improve their living conditions. Having a strategic action plan will add to the visibility of the community. Additionally, well-formulated plans will provide added value for Phase 3, in which the community will partake in participatory processes. These three steps aim to integrate the community into municipal plans, building relationships with each other as well as with external bodies, and will provide the communities with more visibility and recognition. In order to first rebuild the sense of community, we worked on a strategy to develop trust and communication between different people. The major problem is the divide between the people living on the upper area of the hill and the flat area residents. Methods of doing so include community leaders holding recreational activities and events for the youth, such as talent shows and sport events, where parents can be included by acting as judges. Movie screening nights could also be held in the public area, including those that are higher up on the hill, to ensure that accessibility and mobility is less of an issue. In order to increase the chances of people higher up on the hill to merge and integrate with flat area residents, posters can be put up in order to advertise the events. Creating a community board where people can put up event dates, houses for rent, exchange of services, will raise awareness of the opportunities available for the people who live higher up the hill. This will increase their chances of attending such community and government or junta-led events. Once the sense of community has been strengthened, they can move on to the second phase whereby they form solid plans to create their own positive change. Inspired by the community group Red de Mujeres, capacity mapping is at the center of this stage of the strategy. A capacity map is a tool to identify the skills of the inhabitants of the area. There are two main goals to it. First, it will allow people to start a service exchange system whereby people utilize their skills to help one another. This increases community awareness about the methods in which they can improve their living conditions by themselves using local resources, for example, building walls. This will also help to mitigate physical risk on the longer term, for example, they can start projects to build new stairs, new roofs, etc. On a personal level, this mapping also improves self-confidence. 
The indicator for the second strategy is to conduct surveys on mapping methods in order to understand people's perceptions of the effectiveness and the level of satisfaction with the mapping project. In addition to the aforementioned methods, the community could collect and use evidence they have acquired as a tool, showing the injustice of the situation. For example, upon comparison of the Sedapal water bills between residents of El Agustino and Miraflores, despite using a fraction of the water used by those in Miraflores, the community in El Independiente are paying more. The final phase is to involve the communities in the decision-making process. In the case of El Independiente, people are being rendered invisible. The aim of this part is to give a voice to everyone who has a stake, either in person or in representation. Participatory planning would consist of partnerships and joint decisions in order to produce more effective interventions and outcomes. In the case of El Agustino, after capacity mapping, they will have to identify how they can contribute to projects that will ch create change in their community. By then creating concrete plans, the community will have a stronger chance to attract the interest of institutions and governmental bodies and to have a proper around-the-table discussion with other residents in Lima facing similar problems, such as those from Barrios Altos and Jose Carlos Mariategui. The first indicator for step three would be the number of attempts by the community to approach external bodies for roundtable discussions. The final indicator would be the number of proposals that residents create within the level of the community, the level of El Agustino and Metropolitan Lima, as well as the number of successful attempts in gaining attention for their proposed projects, which would allow residents to have an active role in creating the future they envisioned.